This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. Your money is not charity. It's an investment in the global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way. That's Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressing the U.S. Congress, which is debating another $45 billion in emergency aid to his country. Details coming up. Also, Ghana is trying to rebound from an economic meltdown. And Uganda says it has received shipments of two trial vaccines to test against Ebola. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Ghana has been a bastion of stability in a region plagued by civil unrest and coups. The world's second biggest grower of cocoa and Africa's number two gold producer, Ghana began exporting oil in late 2010. Currently, however, its economy is in a meltdown. I asked Alex Vines, Director of Regional Studies and International Security and leader of the Africa program at Chatham House, what caused Ghana's economy to go downhill. Yeah, so Ghana seems to be cyclical. But you, when you get towards the end of a second term of a government, the economy uh, worse, has worsened significantly. Uh, and um, Ghana has been hit by the headwinds also of high inflation. It had gone on to a cycle of profligate buy, uh, borrowing. Interest rates obviously have been hiked too, so Ghana can't, it would not make sense, uh, and Ghana couldn't with the, uh, its economic performance now go to the, the commercial markets to, to kind of raise money uh, to kind of service its debt. And so it's being forced back to, into the embrace of the international financial institutions, the IMF in particular, all at a time uh, as we're kind of getting close to the next Ghanaian election. So uh, Nanu Kufuadu is coming towards the end of his second term. Uh, even myself, uh, we have presidential candidates for the next election beginning to kind of approach Chatham House here to give speeches on, on why they should be president. So it, it is something that we see. But uh, it is very alarming that the CD, the, the Ghanaian currency, is one of the worst performing currencies in, in, in Africa currently, and that you have had such a meltdown. For, for as you correctly see, say, Ghana is seen as a kind of democratic um, an anchor state in a rough neighborhood. And so economic turbulence in Ghana is not good for West Africa at all, both for Ghanaians, but also for their neighbors. So is Ghana now uh, uh, on the way of restructuring its uh, economy uh, through the IMF? Yeah, so that is what's going to happen. And of course, that in itself is is politically controversial in Ghana. Um, you know, a certain generation of Ghanas, Ghanaians always remember the, 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 the structural adjustment programs that they had to go through and the belt tightening and the tightening that occurred and the difficulties that they experienced. So that's always been a very divisive political thing to have to accept that you need to go to the IMF for help. But indeed, that is what is occurring. Uh, and again, I, I think we're likely now to see a cycle where you may have a change of party and, 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 and obviously a new president in, in Ghana. And uh, it's no secret, but the former president, before Nanu Kufuadu, uh, Mahama, uh, is interested in uh, running again for president and is beginning to be on election, uh, electoral maneuvers. It is kind of ironic that one of the reasons he was uh, voted out uh, was, was because of poor uh, husbandry of the Ghanaian economy. So this is why I, I, I say it feels a bit cyclical the way that we look at it. Ghanaian governments tend to survive two terms and, and then get voted out and... Uh, uh, and that's what I think we're going to see here again. Let's say there's a new government. The last government abandoned fiscal discipline and opened the spending taps to, in anticipation of an oil windfall. So will they learn from the past mistake? or? Uh, so uh, uh, new governments coming in tend to be more fiscally disciplined. They say the right things. They, uh, and the markets kind of like it. 
I mean, there are some very strong fundamentals that you outlined already that you know, Ghana is an important gold producer. It does produce, uh, uh, it, it is an oil producer, which in the short to midterm is still important. It is one of the world's leading producers of, of cocoa. Uh, so there is a strong agricultural base. There is enormous potential for tourism and other agricultural um, um, industries. Uh, and so I think, you know, those fundamentals, we're also a better educated workforce, does provide some hope for Ghana uh, in the midterm. But it is a very choppy period now that we're entering into in the build up to this election. And then clearly the austerity that a new government is going to have to pursue in the short term to stabilize the economy before we can get the, 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 the growth that's needed again. That was Alex Vines, Director of Regional Studies and International Security and leader of the African program at Chatham House. He talked to me from London. It was seen as one of the most significant announcements made at the recent U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. U.S. President Joe Biden saying he would support the African Union joining the G20 and securing a permanent seat at the U.N. Security Council. Hilda Suka Mafuzi is the African Union ambassador to the United States. She says it's vital that African nations act collectively on the international stage. Host of VOA Straight Talk Africa, Heidi Adams, uh, sat down with the AU ambassador here in Washington. She asked Suka Mafuzi what the AU sees as a top priority in its engagement with the United States. We are looking at the health issue. The more we are healthier, yes, we'll be able to work. Then we can do trade when we are healthy. So we are looking at a situation whereby we build, it's a world, it's a global challenge at the moment, having us woken up by the COVID-19, that we should, if leadership agree, build a global health entity where each and every country, we know what is happening. I'll give you an example of what Africa CDC did in Africa. They knew how to coordinate each and every minister of health in each and every country in Africa. We are saying, why can't we do that at the global level? And they say, we are sure. Imagine what happened with COVID-19. The minute it was announced, in China, it didn't take, it took a few hours. It was here in the US. It was on Africa. It was in South America. It was, so that's a priority. We, us as a, a continent, we have said, let's put that on the table. It has been an issue that we run with. Us having the challenge of not vaccinating all our people? Why, where did that come from? It's because we don't have the infrastructure We don't have the health systems. We don't have the medications to cover our 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 populations on the continent. All those things. We learned a lesson that was quite a lesson, in which I'm I'm impressed. African Union has put that out, and with the member states, in the U.S. is buying in to say yes. In regards to the issue of health, we've got to work together. These are priorities of the world today, the global priorities. Heidi asked the the ambassador what advice she would give to the Biden-Harris administration. You're also saying that Africans are actually today telling the world how they want to be treated, how they want to be engaged, and what they bring to, to to the stage, to the global economy. Uh, what would your advice be to President Biden um, about how we should engage Africa, the single most important thing you think you should do? Is to embrace Africa as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. I, I'm happy with what is happening. It's getting there. But let's, let's get, I, I would say get stronger. Get stronger and be on that continent. Yes. We have Ubuntu ourselves as Africans. We receive everyone who comes to us, who will come with good things we will gravitate towards. So I'll say to President Biden, this is the time. Don't be left out. Showcase who you are. Africa is watching and is cognizant of who they are and what they want. 
and the, what their value is. So let's meet some way to correct that, to put things in place, to make ourselves benefit both ways. That was African Union Ambassador to the United States, Hilda Suka Mafuzi, speaking to host of VOA's Straight Talk Africa, Heidi Adams, here in Washington. Tomorrow, we'll bring you part two of their conversation. President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed U.S. lawmakers and met with President Joe Biden today in a dramatic visit to the United States to rally his top international partner to sustain its military and economic assistance in Ukraine's fight against the Russian invasion. White House Bureau Chief Patsy Wida Kuswara has this report. President Joe Biden welcomed President Volodymyr Zelensky at the White House on Wednesday in a surprise visit designed to send a message to Russian President Vladimir Putin that the United States will be there for Ukraine for as long as it takes. And he's trying to use winter as a weapon, and, uh, but the Ukrainian people continue to inspire the world. I mean that sincerely. Not just inspire us, but inspire the world with their courage and how they uh, have chose their resilience and resolve for their future. Zelensky thanked Biden and gave him a cross for military merit medal that belonged to a Ukrainian soldier, captain of a HIMARS battery given by the U.S. He's very brave, and he said, give it to a very brave president. And I want to give you that the cross, cross for military merit. As Zelensky touched down on U.S. soil on his first trip abroad since the Russian invasion began in February, the U.S. announced $1.85 billion in additional security assistance for Ukraine, including the Patriot defense system that will help protect against Russian missiles, a move Moscow calls provocative. On Wednesday, Putin said Russia had nothing to be blamed for on the war. On the contrary, this is the result of the policy of other countries, third countries, which have always driven for this, towards the disintegration of the Russian world. In remarks before a joint meeting of Congress, Zelensky appealed to U.S. lawmakers who are debating another $45 billion in emergency aid to Ukraine, which would bring the total American wartime assistance to more than $100 billion. Your money is not charity. It's an investment in the global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way. A recent Chicago Council poll finds that while 65% of Americans continue to support U.S. assistance to Ukraine, they're split between supporting for as long as it takes and wanting Washington to urge Kyiv to settle for peace as soon as possible. Patsy Widaguswara, VOA News, Washington. You're listening to African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Ivor Ichikowitz is the head of the South Africa's Paramount Group, an arms and military equipment manufacturer. He is also the head of the Ichikowitz Foundation. The philanthropic group has done surveys of what Africa's young adults are thinking. Ichikowitz attended the recent U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, where VOA's Peter Cloty caught up with him. In the second part of their interview, Ichikowitz begins by talking about the role the United States can play in expanding data access in Africa. Very interestingly, when we approached the youth, when we approached this demographic and asked them what they considered to be basic human rights, they didn't see water as a basic human right, or access to water. They didn't see access to electricity as a basic human right, but they saw access to data, cost-effective data, as a fundamental basic human right. And they indicated that that it's one of the things that they would take to the streets to ensure that, that they had access to. Now, this is an area that the United States can play a huge role in, Most of the telecommunications infrastructure in Africa today is is of Chinese origin. Um, The mobile operators have made out like bandits on the continent. And there is an opportunity to leapfrog this technology, as only the United States can, to give connectivity and data to the next generation of Africans. And with that, we will absolutely ensure that this is a generation that will be able to play in the international community without leaving home. And this is very important because most young Africans see themselves as global citizens. They are connected to youth elsewhere in the world. 
And they are saying that if they can't get opportunities at home, they will migrate to get those opportunities. Mm. So the biggest value add that the United States can give to Africa today is to help create and democratize access to data. I was the African Union uh, has been granted President Biden's endorsement to ascend to the G20. It's this timely, uh, taking place in the direct wake of the tremendous potential being realized from the forming of the African Continental Free Trade Area or AF. Uh, AFC FTA and how does Africa's next generation envision its potential to forge autonomous economic growth? The G20 has become the organization that looks after the interests of the globe. Mm -hmm. Africa represents a huge part of our landmass and will represent the biggest body of population. There is no way that the world can take decisions about our collective future without involving Africa. Mm -hmm. The mere fact that the European Union is, is on the G20 automatically should entitle Africa to be on the G20. So President Biden's initiative is, is timely. It's very much welcome. Mm -hmm. It might be a little late, but better late than never. And I think that it is a very, very important initiative. Africa is, is, is the biggest carbon sink f for the world. Mm -hmm. It is, however, the continent that benefits the least from, from global carbon, uh, the global carbon economy. Huge pressure is placed on African governments to keep that carbon sink in place. In order to do so, we have to restrict growth and development in these countries. It is essential that the carbon economy contributes to African governments to compensate them for the challenges to growth and development that keeping these carbon sinks in place is causing. Mm -hmm. and, and ascension to the G20 and giving Africa a meaningful voice in the, in the entire, in the global community is going to allow us to fight for those, for those rights. Mm -hmm. That was Ivor Ichikowitz, the South African industrialist and head of the Ichikowitz Foundation, speaking with my colleague Peter Koloti. Uganda says it has received shipments of two trial vaccines to test against Ebola, according to the French news agency AFP. Health Minister Jane Ruth Akeng says Uganda received 2,600 doses last Saturday from Merck, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Earlier in December, 2,000 doses arrived from the Oxford University Jenner Institute, manufactured by the Serum Institute of India. The government will also test a third vaccine from the Sabin Institute in the United States. AFP says the three medications will be used in a so-called ring vaccination trial that includes all contacts of confirmed patients as well as the contacts of contacts and frontline and health workers. The government says it has begun enlisting volunteers for the trials. Since the outbreak on September 20th, 56 out of 142 infected people have died from Ebola. The last person with the disease was discharged from hospital on November 13th. In its latest directive to media, the Somali government has requested that local news outlets submit con content for approval before it airs. Ahmed Mohammed reports for Mogadishu. Several media houses in Mogadishu told VOA this week that the president's communication office has ordered them to submit news content to authorities before it airs. Among those affected is Risala Media Corporation in the capital, Mogadishu. It is managing director is Mohammed Abdi Wahab. He says the objective was censorship because directing the media to send the items is just to single out the items that they don't like. He adds, therefore, its implementation is risk to Somali media and cannot be implemented. Deputy Information Minister Abdurrahman Yusuf Al Adala told VOA via messaging app that he was not aware of such directive. But Abdul Wahab says an official called his company with a directive on December 17th. He believes the order infringes on the country's constitution and media law. 
both of which provide guarantees for media freedom. The directive is the latest government order issued to media. In recent months, journalists were warned off from publishing a Shabab content and to refer the militant group only as Khawarij, which loosely translates as those who deviate from the Islamic faith. The Somali government is engaged in a military campaign against Al Shabab. But journalists say the directive on covering the group will limit press freedom and could put them at risk of retaliation. Somali journalist syndicate spokesperson Mohamed Bulbul sees the order as another move to curtail independence. And he says it will have an impact on journalists and the media, and if it's not rejected, then there will be no media or journalists reporting the truth. We are not ready to work with the government in the implementation of this directive, but we are ready to work with the government in ways to improve freedom of expression. The Somali Journalist Syndicate, an umbrella organization for media that protested directives, has come under pressure from the authorities. Its Secretary General, Abdullah Ahmed Mumin, is currently on bail after two arrests in October and November. Journalists say submitting content will interfere with the editorial independence and the public's right to know. Abdurrahman Adani is the editor of Garaway Online. He says this new directive paves the way for the government to silence the independence media, which is now the only trusted source of news for the public. Adani says the directive will force media to surrender their watchdog role. He says this directive passed the media from disseminating the truth, and it also passed the media from airing and past news. It also blocks the media from reporting any items which are against the will of the government. Somalia is already a difficult environment for reporters, media watchdogs say, as well as attacks and threats, journalists risk arrest. In the latest case, the British-based freelancer Jamal Osman, who has won awards for his coverage of Al-Shabaab, was arrested in Mogadishu this week and deported to the UK. The reason for his deportation was not made public. Ahmed Mohammed for VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib.